But uh, Lomax has got some great music picked out for us and just looking forward to seeing what God is going to do. Let us begin by turning to God's word for our call to worship. Psalm 30, verse 4 through 8, and then 11 and 12. Listen to what the word of God says. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. But your favor, O Lord, you made a, my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. Oh, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the hope that it gives each and every one of us. Lord, we praise you for your, your blessings in this life, some of them unexpected. And Lord, each and every day as we look to you for the source of strength and to meet our needs, we just want to take a moment and say thank you for all your blessings and all your provisions and all your protection and the way that you just continually give us more than we ever deserve. Let us remember that as we focus our hearts and minds on worshiping you. In Jesus' name, amen. A lot last week and uh, I appreciate it and uh, we were in Jay yesterday and I happened to meet one of our chaplains good friends Chip Fox he was the director of missions in Santa Rosa County for a number of years and my personal pastor for a number of years so we had a good talk and I was he's a good friend of Jim and uh, I was telling him about about Jim I, I told him we were having a little problem with Jim he was a little shy and, uh, we were trying to warm him up though so I think if you'll help me we can we can get it there it was all positive uh, I did get some comments last from last week about the uh, Ebenezer Stone, and it was all positive, and thank you very much for that. Today we're going to be singing, I think, some good, good songs, and uh, one of them, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, that's the one we'll start with today. And uh, a little of the background on this song, I found it very interesting. If you look down at the bottom of the page, somebody that you may recognize, the name Beethoven. Hey, I didn't know he, but he found his way into our hymn book. It seems like way back there in 1824, 1824, he wrote his final symphony, symphony number nine. And in the final movement of that song appeared a little movement and uh, it was called Ode to Joy. And if you know a little bit about Beethoven, you knew, know that he started going blind early in his life, in his 20s. And by the time he wrote his last uh, symphony, number nine, he was completely blind. He wrote it from his mind, his memory. He could hear the notes in his mind 
He was a genius to be able to do that. And this particular night was an hour and 10 minutes long. And it took him some 10 years. He went blind, I think, in the, when he was in his 40s. And now he was in his middle 50s. He would die two years later, I think, or two and a half years later. But this song became then the song of joy. And it's a bright song. It's a happy song. And as you guess, it's a joyful song. So that's what we're going to sing about. And if you can join us, I'd like for you to stand with us and, and sing. All three verses. Joyful, joyful. Yeah. 
opportunity to say good morning to those that may have come in late. Please stand and greet one another. Come on now. Let's get moving. to make today. Carolina is now a great grandmother. She came up to me before the service and she said, Brother Jim, do I look any different? I said, you look more joyful. She goes, I am. And it shows I am. What's, what's the baby's name, Carolina? Elijah. Elijah. He was 20... 21 inches long? 20, what'd you say? 21 hours of labor. Oh, 21 hours of labor. Yeah. Wow. He wasn't quite ready to come into the world, was he? Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer again and thank him for the joys of the day. Lord, we do thank you for the joy of life, for the fellowship with friends, and the opportunity to gather and worship. And we just pray that you will be foremost in all of the things that we do today that we will glorify you with our words and with our hearts and our acts of worship. To you be all glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're gonna, going to do the next song a little different, <laughs> but I need your help to keep me on the right verse. <laughs> Number, hymn number 128, we're going to do the first verse in the course, or the refrain, then we'll do the second, third, and fourth verses, and then the course. So the course only will be after the first and the fourth verses. So help me stay straight. <laughs>
Mercy, mercy, 
goodness of God and you know we say all the time God is so good but when you listen to the words of this song if I can make it through without crying there's so many things in life just taking another breath every day and that we woke up and that our feet move and you could go on and on and on of what he's done and the goodness of him but I really want you to pay attention to the words and just <laughs> focus on just how good he truly is I love you Lord oh your mercy never fails me and all my They're motioning back there to me and hold. Now is this one? Yeah. This one, okay. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days have been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. Oh, yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good with every breath that I of the goodness of God. I love your voice. Oh, you've led me through the fire and in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. Oh, yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good with every breath that I am Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. 
Yes, I will sing of the goodness of my God. And now we all sing. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He is so good to me. Thank you so much. Anticipating Bev and Shane being with us today, my mic's still off, and it was a blessing to have her mom and aunt sing with her. Isn't it amazing how well families' voices seem to blend? I guess turn on the pulpit mic because mine's not working either. Did the power go off in the back again? It did. <laughs> Apologize, folks. <laughs> blessing that is the title of the message today and we have many of them in life and just having Shane and Beverly and her family sing and be here with us today is just wonderful and I'm so grateful for that it means a lot to me personally because they are dear friends but we have so many other things to be thankful for we have an excellent pianist who helps coordinate our music we have John who's another dear friend playing on the guitar and he is constantly growing. We've got the three guys in the back who do a great job uh, helping us get everything amplified and on video. But we do have days like this where we have some errors that take place. We got gremlins sometimes, as I call them. And, but it's not because of their lack of diligence and hard work. So we thank them so much for their faithfulness as well. Well, it was Johnny's first day of school, and his teacher had asked him to lead the Pledge of Allegiance for the class. And the teacher asked the children to put their hands, their right hand over their heart as they led in the pledge. And she was watching all the children as Johnny started the pledge. And Johnny was standing like this. I pledge allegiance. And the teacher said, Johnny, what, what are you doing? Stop. Why is your hand not on your heart? And he says, well, my hand is on my heart. And she goes, no, Johnny, that's not your heart. And he said, ma'am, it is my heart. He said, because when my granny visits, she picks me up and she pats me right here and says, bless your heart. <laughs> what an unexpected blessing of laughter this little boy must have brought his teacher, amen? But this is not the kind of unexpected blessing that we're going to talk about this morning. There have been many times in my life where I have been the recipient of unexpected blessings. Let me share just one of the things that God orchestrated in my life during a transitional time, and it was an uncertain time in my life. I had made the decision to transition from secular work into full-time ministry work, and it required some give and take. My family sacrificed, I sacrificed, uh, friends and others sacrificed to help that become a reality. But one of the, the moments that really stuck with me was I had resigned my position with the company I was for. We were preparing to move and God delayed that move for his own reasons, which I can look back on now and see. But while going through it, it was very difficult and I struggled. And it was one of those moments in your life where you have that crisis of faith. God, what are you doing in my life? Why are you doing this to my family? And what was happening was I was now unemployed because the job that I was going to have when we relocated had a hiring freeze and now we're in limbo and our move is now delayed and we don't know why that took place. Well, I was sharing this with a neighbor friend of mine who 
was an accountant and he's a Christian and we had become friends over the years that we lived there together and just told him what was going on. He asked one day when I went out to the mailbox uh, how things were going and I explained to him what I basically explained to you and I don't know how we're going to pay the bills. Well, God and his unexpected blessings came our way because this man whom I will always cherish and love for his compassion and obedience to what the Lord laid on his heart had a check cut from his business to pay my mortgage for that month. Think about that. Is that not a love letter from God saying, I got you covered. You don't need to worry about what I'm going to do for you. Well, to make a long story short, his secretary had put me in as a regular recurring payment. And I got another check the next month. <laughs> and I went to him and I said, brother, I said, I appreciate your generosity, but I don't expect you to pay my mortgage. He said, that was a mistake. And I said, well, you want the check back? Because I haven't deposited it because I knew something was wrong. He says, no, I want to bless you with that too. So for two months, God paid my mortgage through my neighbor. To fast forward a little bit, when we finally did make the move, God's timing was ordained for a reason. We thought he was closing a door, but he was opening one and protecting us. And the other unexpected blessing was that the housing market continued to rise for another year. And a year later, we sold our house for 100000 more than we would have had we left when I thought we were supposed to leave. That enabled us to buy our house in Graceland because I couldn't work. All the jobs were while we were in school. But God provided those blessings along the way. And we're going to look at some of the blessings that God provided Ruth and Naomi in our passage this morning. Because there are many that are there. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the unexpected blessings that we have each and every day. And sometimes we overlook them or we don't recognize them because we're just caught up in the busyness of, of life. So, Lord, I pray today that we will slow down and just think upon the truths that we see in this scripture today. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be found acceptable in your sight. You're my rock, you're my Lord, and you are my Redeemer. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2, and it will be on the screen behind me as we go through this chapter, this is what the Word of God says. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. One of the things we see here is uh, as a reason for why we are blessed, we are blessed by the providence of God. We are blessed by the providence of God. There's a Latin proverb that says, Providence assists not the idle. And since Ruth was not the kind of woman who was going to sit around and do nothing about her circumstances, she asked Naomi if she could have permission to go and glean in the fields so that they would have food to eat. But it was God's providence that led her to the field of Boaz. This was a step of faith on Ruth's part. Based on God's commandment in the law, biblical law designated gleanings as a provision for orphans, widows, and the poor. So what would happen is as they are doing the harvest and picking up all of their crops, they would intentionally leave some behind for those that had no money to buy food so that they would not starve in the land. 
God gave the harvest and he had every right to tell the people what to do to take care of those who had need. Well, the existence of this law is proof of God's concern for the poor among his people. And the nation was instructed to treat the poor with kindness and with generosity. But God was also concerned for the widows and many of them who were poor themselves. And he told the people to take care of them. And Ruth was not only a poor widow, but she was also a foreigner. So she had several marks against her in the society in which she was living. Well, Deuteronomy 10, 18 says, God executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. So God's providence was watching out for Ruth. To live by faith means that we take God at his word and then we act upon that faith because James says, without works, or excuse me, faith without works is dead. So we need to exercise our faith. We can't just work and work thinking we're gonna get something from it. Our faith is what causes us to work. So when we say we have faith, we also have to do something with that faith. We have to exercise it, we have to live it out. And Ruth believed that God loved her and through his divine providence to care for her, she set out to find a field in which she could glean. And this was completely an act of faith because, as I said, she was a stranger in this land. She had no rights. She had no reason to think that somebody would show her any favor. You know, there were boundary markers for each parcel, but there were no fences and no name signs of who owned what field like we might see on today's farms where you have the name of the family overhead when you come to their property. But she was an outsider, and she was especially vulnerable and she had to be careful where she went. And it's here that Boaz enters this story. And he's a relative of Elimelech, and we read about that. It says he was a worthy man in the community. His name means in him is strength. And by the providence of God and by his orchestration, he leads Ruth to be in his field. Verse 3 says that Ruth just happened to come to his portion of the field. But I'm here to tell you. It is not an accident. It isn't happenstance. It was by God's divine providence that she ended up in his field. Her steps were guided by the Lord. Genesis 24, 27 says, The Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen. God's providential working in our lives is both a delight and it's also a mystery to us, isn't it? We wonder how God is doing things, but when we always look back, we can see how he orchestrated certain people to be in our lives at certain times and certain things to take place at certain times. And then we can see how God provided. God is constantly working with us. He's working in us and he's working for us as his children. And he is accomplishing his purposes. We pray and we seek his will and we, we make decisions and sometimes we even make mistakes. Can I get a witness? But it's God who orchestrates all of those events for his purposes. So when Ruth set out to go and glean in the morning that, that day, she was looking for somebody who just might show her some grace. Now, what is grace? Grace is unmerited favor to someone who does not deserve it. It's, it's favor to someone who doesn't earn it, doesn't deserve it, shouldn't have it. And as a woman, as a widow, and as an alien in a foreign land, Ruth could make no claim of her own, and she could not find anyone who would support her and be held accountable for it. She was the lowest rung of the social ladder. She was a nobody. But God and his grace was channeled through Boaz. What a blessing to know that God has good people living, even in diff, difficult, tough times. We're in a tough time now in this country. Financially, people are suffering. The economy is not doing well. Jobs are being slashed by corporations. This is a great opportunity for us to be a blessing when God brings those people into our lives. 
Ask him to give you, like I tell you all the time, those divine disruptions. You don't know what they're going to be. It might be that you just need to pray for them. It might be that you need to encourage them with a kind word. It might be that you need to financially help them. God is good that way. He's been good to you, so why not help someone in need? We can be a Boaz to somebody who doesn't deserve it. But let God use us to channel his grace to others. If you only knew the record of the book of Judges, you might conclude that the righteous had perished from the earth, but God still uses people, even in the darkest of days. And there's still people like Boaz who knew the Lord and sought to obey his will. And when God laid a burden on their heart, just like my friend across the street laid a burden on his heart, he responded to what God told him to do. Boaz was concerned about his workers and he wanted them to enjoy the blessings of the Lord. Boaz was highly blessed and favored and he wanted to make sure that all those who helped him get there were taken care of as well. No sooner had Boaz greeted his workers than his eye caught the presence of this stranger in his field and a lovely stranger at that. I get the impression that the moment Boaz laid his eyes on her was much like when I first met my wife. It was love at first sight. I knew the night I met her that I met my wife. It just took me three years to convince her that I was Mr. Wright. <laughs> but Boaz changes his focus. His focus is no longer on the harvest, but it's on Ruth. Every decision he makes, every command he gives was for her benefit. Ruth was an outsider, but even though she was an outsider, she was a, an eligible young woman whom the men of the town would have certainly noticed. And verse 11 indicates that Boaz had already heard about her, but now he had the chance to meet her personally. You know, we, we can marvel at the supreme divine providence of God in this passage. The Lord led Ruth to the field of Boaz, and then he led Boaz to the field while Ruth was there. What if he had gotten there a little bit later or while she was on a break and wasn't out there and he didn't notice her and he went on about his business? God is perfect in all of his details to make those things happen at exactly the right moment in time when it needs to happen. What if she'd grown weary and gone home to Naomi? She would have missed out on the blessing. But when we commit our lives to the Lord, what happens to us happens by the way of an appointment that God has made, not by accident. There's times when we have accidents in life and we can meet somebody through that interaction that disrupts our day and God can use it to be a blessing. And have y'all ever had that happen before where you meet somebody through an accident and then they become close friends? You never know what God's going to do. Ruth was a widow and a foreigner, but God was about to create a new relationship that would completely rework her circumstances. And just like Ruth, we are blessed by God's divine providence. Verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother and native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. When he says you've come under the wings to take refuge, that tells me that we are blessed by the protection of God. 
We are blessed by the protection of God. How many things in life, how many times in life has God protected you from yourself, <laughs> let alone from harm from others? Well, as here, he took the, the initiative to intervene in Ruth's life. Did you know what? God does the same thing. He makes the first move to come to our rescue, not because we deserve anything, but because he loves us and wants the best for us, and he wants us for himself. 1 John 4, 19 tells us that we are only capable of loving because he first loved us. We don't know what the meaning of love is. Our, our world has so corrupted that word love. Oh, I love this, or I love that, or I love this food, or that food, or I love this style of clothing, or I love this kind of music, or that kind of music. And it so dilutes the true meaning of love. Love is unconditional. Love is unchanging. Yes, it is an emotion, but most of all, it's a choice. It's a decision that we make to love others. And it's a command. If you love me, then you will obey me. And then later Jesus says, love one another because by the love you demonstrate, the world will know me. That's the kind of love that Boaz demonstrates. That's the kind of love that God demonstrates. God took the initiative in our salvation that when we were still yet dead to sin, he loved us. And he went to the cross. Salvation is not an afterthought of God. It was always the plan from eternity past that Jesus would die for you and me. We have every reason to believe that Boaz loved Ruth and therefore he took the first steps to meet her and her needs. And then he went and he spoke to her. It was Boaz who first spoke to Ruth because Ruth would not have dared to speak to a man, let alone to the owner of the field. Yet he interrupted his conversation with his foreman to speak to this stranger who was gleaning in the field. Well, Almighty God has spoken to us as well. How does he speak? He speaks through his word. He speaks through his son. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, God has in these last days spoken to us by his son. He not only speaks the word of salvation, but he also gives us guidance that we need each and every day. Just as Boaz instructed Ruth as what to do and not to do, so the Lord also shares his words of wisdom as to what we're not supposed to do and what we are to do through his word. And he directs our daily living. And the Holy Spirit that indwells within us helps us to, to have discernment and to make those right choices. Well, Boaz, he promised to protect Ruth, and Boaz called Ruth my daughter in verse 9 because she was younger than him, but also it was a term of endearment. He would treat her as if she was a member of his own family. You remember we talked about this in our Bible study about David and Mephibosheth, how David brought him under his protection, and he adopted him into his own family. That was Jonathan's son who was crippled. And he made him part of the family. That's what Boaz was doing for Ruth. She was to walk with the female servants and she was to walk after the reapers and she was to have the best of the gleanings. And he also instructed them to let her glean among the sheaves, those things that had already been harvested so she didn't have to do as much work. And then he told her if she's thirsty, then she can refresh herself from the water that was drawn by the men in the fields. And in fact, Boaz brought her to his own table and ate with her. And he personally handed her the food. What a picture of the grace of God. The master became like the servants that he might show his love to a foreigner. Ruth had no idea that Boaz had commanded his workers to be generous to her, but she believed his word. And she found that her needs were met. We well, you know Jesus Christ came to this earth as a servant that he might save us and make us part of his family. Did you know that? You see all the correlations that are here? He shared with us the riches of his mercy and his love, the riches of his wisdom and his knowledge, his riches and glory, and yes, his unsearchable riches to us who are undeserving foreigners or sojourners. 
This is not our home. Our home is in heaven. We're just passing through. Yet we're considered members of the family of God. And we are all co-heirs with Christ and his inheritance. What a blessing. Boaz, he encouraged Ruth. And Ruth's response to him and all that he was doing was one of humility and one of gratitude. She acknowledged her own unworthiness. She accepted his grace freely and appreciatively. She believed in his promises and she rejoiced in them. There was no need for Ruth to worry about anything because this wealthy landowner, this Lord of the harvest would care for her and also care for Naomi. How did she know he would care for her? Because he gave her a promise. And she knew that he could be trusted. Ruth neither looked back at her tragic past, nor did she look at herself and consider her sad circumstances. She looked beyond them. She fell at the feet of the master and she submitted <clears throat> to him. She looked away from her poverty and focused on his riches. She forgot her fears and rested in his promises. What an example for us as God's children to follow today. You know, I found that so many people are miserable because they don't obey the admonition of Hebrews 12 2, where it tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Folks, if you look to him, everything else gets smaller. All those things that we think are insurmountable, all those trials, all those difficulties, all those sufferings, all those tragedies that we face in this life become nothing but a hiccup in the grand scheme of things when we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. You know, people spend so much time looking to themselves, looking to their circumstances, looking to other people, and they fail to do what Ruth did, and that is to focus her attention on the Lord. How many of our problems would go away if we would just do that one thing? Instead of resting in his perfections, people focus on their own imperfections. How much heartache does that bring? Instead of seeing his spiritual riches, they complain about their bankruptcy. They go to church to get their needs met rather than to go and worship the God who is the creator and who can provide for any need. They need to heed the counsel of this little poem filled with great wisdom. Listen to what it says. Look at self and be distressed. Look at others and be depressed. Look at Jesus and you'll be blessed. Amen. <laughs> Ruth was protected because of her faith in the God of Israel. And Boaz fully knew Ruth's story because it didn't take long for news to travel in a small town like Bethlehem. And he knew that Ruth had abandoned her home. She had abandoned those gods that they once worshiped. She had put her faith in the one true God, the Lord Almighty. And she had taken refuge and found this protection under his wings. And that image often refers to a, chick, a chicken protecting her chicks, a hen rather, but it can also refer to the wings of the cherubim that fills the Holy of Holies. Ruth was no longer a foreigner. And she was no longer a stranger. She had accepted and believed and worshipped in the God of Israel, but she was also dwelling in the very Holy of Holies where he exists. Ruth had trusted the Lord, and she had proved her faith by cleaving to her mother-in-law. And she had become part of the people of Israel in the town of Bethlehem. And the phrase in verse 13, spoken kindly, means to be spoken from the heart. Folks, the word of God comes from the heart, according to Psalm 33. It comes to the hearts of his people, and it gives us encouragement, and it provides us with hope. And if you listen to the voices in this world, you will be discouraged. But if you listen to the voice of God, and you listen to the word of God, you will be encouraged. There's a huge difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom that comes from God. And when we seek satisfaction anywhere else, we'll find ourselves dissatisfied and we'll ultimately become disobedient. These lost 
in our world find that their labors and their pursuits will never satisfy. <clears throat> but we have full satisfaction because of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to live by the faith and the providence of God, but we also need to depend on God's grace for protection. But there's another unexpected blessing we receive from God. Let's look at the final part of this chapter and we'll reveal it. <clears throat> Verse 14. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. And when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even from among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some of the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an epaph of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over from after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, This man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with this, his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young woman of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Folks, we are blessed by the provision of God. All day long, Ruth labored with a happy and hopeful heart because of God's providence. She didn't have to worry about the men harassing her or the other workers hindering her because of God's protection. And here she had food when she was hungry. She had drink when she was thirsty and a place to rest when she became weary. Why? Because of God's provision. God always provides. We read about that over and over in the scriptures. The grain she gleaned amounted to about half a bushel and that was enough for the two women to have for nearly a week. She also had some food left over from her meal. And she shared it with Naomi. She not only was a diligent worker, but she was also careful not to waste anything that she had received from the Lord. That's a lesson we need to heed as well. So how did Naomi respond to Ruth's experiences? Well, the last time we heard anything from Naomi, what was she doing? She was expressing her bitterness to the women of Bethlehem. And she was blaming God for all of her sorrows and for the fact that she was now living in poverty. But when Ruth asked for permission to go to the fields, all Naomi said to her was, go, go, my daughter. She was still bitter. She gave her no word of encouragement. She never even promised that she would be praying for her. She said, go. But now, we hear a new word spoken from her lips. Blessed. Blessed. We see it twice. We've moved from bitterness to blessedness. And when Naomi saw the grain, she said, Blessed is the man who gave you favor and allowed you to work in the field. And then when she heard that that man's name was Boaz, she said, Blessed be the Lord. What a change has taken place in her heart. What a change that had been transforming in her and it had taken her from being a grieving widow to one who was filled with gratitude. This change came about because of the hope that she had in her heart. And the one who gave her that hope is Boaz, who is there by the Lord's provision. Naomi had hope also because Boaz was a kinsman who was wealthy and very influential. And as we'll see in a few minutes, he was a kinsman redeemer. 
And a kinsman redeemer could rescue relatives from poverty and give them a new life. So she had hope that she wouldn't be stuck where she was. But she also had hope because of what Boaz did. He showed kindness to Ruth and took a personal interest in her and her situation. And when Ruth shared with Naomi what Boaz had said, Naomi's hope grew even stronger because of the words that were revealed about his love for Ruth and his desire to make her happy. Boaz insisted on Ruth staying close to his servants. And in his field was proof that he cared for her. Should we who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ not rejoice because of the hope that we have in him? How often do we just let the hope that we have in Christ be squelched by the troubles of this world? When we consider who God is and what he's done for us and what he says to us in his word, there is no reason whatsoever for us to ever feel hopeless. We should always be hopeful. We should be full of hope. We should be so full of hope that it's overflowing and other people can get a taste of it. Amen? We have so much to be thankful for. Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he died for us and he intercedes for us from heaven with our prayers. He's given us precious and great promises according to 2 Peter 1 4 that can never fail. So no matter how you feel today, no matter how difficult your circumstances may be, you can rejoice in the hope that you have if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and not in this world. There was an agnostic named Robert Ingersoll, and he said hope is the only universal liar who is never who never loses his reputation for veracity. What an outlook of negativity in his life. Well, Norman Cousins, who was the former editor of the Saturday Review, had miraculous, miraculously survived an almost incurable illness. He had a severe heart attack as well, and he explicitly disagrees with Mr. Ingersoll. Listen to what he said. The human body experiences a, power, a powerful gravitational pull in the direction of hope. That's why a patient's hopes are the physician's secret weapon. They are the hidden ingredients in any prescription, end quote. And folks, guess what? Research has proven what he said to be true. When a person who is sick and ill has hope, guess what? They heal, they recover, and oftentimes they overcome whatever illness was life-threatening to them. Hope is powerful and for us as Christians hope is not some superficial I hope so I hope it's a possibility that could happen it's some opportunistic or or optimistic fantasy that's how the world sees hope but you know what hope is biblically hope is a sense of confident assurance it is something that will happen it is true we don't have to doubt it. We can know that what God promises will happen. We can face the future because he is with us. And this hope is God's gift to us through his Holy Spirit who reminds us of God's promises that are found in his word. Ruth's first, uh, uh, Ruth's half bushel of grain was her first fruits of all that Boaz would do in her future. The Holy Spirit within us is God's first fruits to us of all that God has promised to us. Although Ruth's supply of grain will be gone in a week, the witness of the Holy Spirit within us, folks, that will last for all eternity until we see Jesus Christ face to face. Amen? This exciting new hope that now possessed the two widows was centered on a person, and his name was Boaz. Our hope is centered on a person too, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus Christ is our hope. And through our faith in him, we have been born again into a living hope. Now pay attention to that phrase, a living hope. What does that imply? It is a living hope, so that means it grows. 
It grows in strength. And it grows in stature. And something that's living produces something. Our hope produces fruit. And the hope that the world clings to is something that is dead. It's a dead hope. But ours is a living hope that is rooted in Jesus Christ, who is the living God. Well, Naomi, in her conversation with Ruth, likely explained the law of the kinsman redeemer. And I just want to give you a brief overview in case you don't know about it. Well, the kinsman redeemer had five responsibilities according to Mosaic law. Number one, to ensure that the hereditary property of the clan never passed out of the clan. Number two, their responsibility was to maintain the freedom of individuals within the clan by buying back those who had sold themselves into slavery because of poverty. Number three, to track down and execute murderers of near relatives. Number four, to receive restitution money on behalf of a deceased victim of a crime. And finally, number five, to ensure that justice is served in a lawsuit involving a relative. That was what a kinsman redeemer was responsible to do for his family. It was not just the kindness and love of Boaz for Ruth that gave Naomi confidence. Because those wonderful feelings can change overnight, right? It was the principle of this redemption that God had written into his law and into his word that gave Naomi the assurance that Boaz would rescue them. As a near relative, Boaz would redeem the family property that Elimelech had a mortgaged off when he took his family to Moab. Naomi wasn't wealthy. She wasn't capable or, or uh, had the ability to redeem it. But Boaz could buy it back and keep it in the family and she could live there. Well, according to tradition, the wife of the, of the deceased went with the property. So the kinsman redeemer would marry her and bring up children bearing the name of the deceased. And they would then inherit the property, the family name, and all those possessions would continue to be theirs. This is known as a leveret marriage. And that's talked about in Deuteronomy 25. And the word levier is Latin for a husband's brother. Now, the author of the book of Ruth doesn't explain how Ruth's husband, Malon, was connected to his father's property, but obviously it had transferred hands when Elimelech had died. So now Ruth was the one who would be redeemed. The barley harvest occurred during March and April, and the wheat harvest took place in June and July. And Ruth, she kept busy during both of those seasons, harvesting everything she could. But now her labor was motivated by a great hope rather than just for a sense of survival. She was anticipating that day of redemption that would come. And God used Ruth to turn Naomi's bitterness into gratitude and her unbelief into faith and her despair into hope. And one person trusting the Lord and obeying his will can change the situation from defeat to victory. Ruth's faith in God and his word led her to the field of Boaz. And the love of Boaz for Ruth compelled him to pour out his grace upon her and meet every need that she had. And her experience with this grace gave her new hope as she anticipated her kinsman redeemer and what that would entail. <coughs> First Corinthians 13, 13 says, so now faith, hope, and love abide and these three, but the greatest of these is love. Before God changes our circumstances, he wants to change our hearts. And if our circumstances change for the better, but we remain the same, we've actually gotten worse. God's purpose in his providence is not to make us comfortable, but to make us conformable. He wants to shape us and transform us. He wants to conform us into the image of his son. Christ-like character is the divine goal for each of us as his children. Naomi, she was bitter against God. But Ruth was willing for God to have his way with her life. So God began his gracious work with her. And then she would ultimately influence Naomi. And then God could bring to pass this wonderful work that would eventually bring the, the Son of God through these women. Pretty amazing, isn't it? That would fulfill God's promise that he made to Abraham. Ruth's story begins with the death 
of her husband, but it will end with the birth of a baby. Her tears will be turned into triumph. So we must allow God to work in our lives and in our circumstances if we want to accomplish his gracious purposes. But there's a few certain steps that we must follow that we've looked at today. Number one, we must live by faith in the providence of God. We must live by the grace of God's protection. And we must acknowledge the provision from God. As we close, let me share a brief story that illustrates this beautifully. One morning, R.C. Chapman, who was a devout Christian, was asked how he was feeling, my friend. This happens to us every day, right? How you feel? His response was, I'm burdened this morning. But he had this happy countenance that contradicted the words that came from his mouth. So his friend ex expressed surprise. He said, are you really burdened, Mr. Chapman? And he said, yes. But it's a wonderful burden. It is an overabundance of blessings for which I cannot find enough time or words to express my gratitude. Seeing the puzzled look on his friend's face, Chapman added with a smile, I'm referring to Psalm 68, 19, which fully describes my condition. And in that verse, the Father in heaven reminds us that he daily bears our burdens. So because God bears our burdens, we don't have to. So even though we may be burdened this morning when we give them over to the Lord, we can have joy in our hearts and a smile on our face that contradicts the words that we say sometimes. What an unexpected blessing. Trust in God for his providence, for his protection, and for his provision. You know, I shared with y'all last week about my son and his journey and I know it's time to go but I want to tell you what God has done it seemed like his opportunity was over he was no longer going to be playing football and God did something amazing this past week he entered the portal on Monday at 4.15 in the afternoon by Tuesday morning, he had been contacted by a dozen different schools. By the end of the week, 16 schools have contacted him and he's been offered six full scholarships plus living expenses. <laughs> God's provision, God's providence, and God's protection have been working in my life through that situation. <clears throat> Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for celebrating with me, and I'll keep you updated as this journey goes on. But we're going to be doing a lot of traveling in the next two weeks. So I may not be around for one of those weeks, but uh, just pray for me and that we can find out where God wants him to ultimately attend school for his graduate work and play football to pay for it. So let's pray, and then Lomax is going to sing us out. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to worship you and just to thank you for your your grace and your love and your mercy. Lord, you provide great things each and every day if we will just open our eyes to see. Let us always have our eyes fixed upon you. And may you receive glory and praise for how we live our lives in accordance to your word. Lord, bless us as we go from here. Comfort our hearts and give us strength where we need strength and let us rest where we need rest. And thank you again are always looking out for us. In your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Stand if you would like and join with us. Hymn number 158 singing the first verse.